Ahmad joined us in Dar es Salaam for our Fiqh of Zakat program. And this week, a uh, very, very important session with our dear Sheikh Hassan Atur is going to be about strengthening your connection and your relationship with the Quran. We all know that the month of Ramadan is known as the month of Quran. Uh, and inshallah, today we're going to learn what we can do to not only uh, better read the Quran, but also deeper understanding of it. Sheikh Hassan Atur, mashallah, he is currently serving as one of the various Imams at the prayer center of Orland Park. Mashallah, he came almost more than an hour away. Uh, he also studied at the University of Medina uh, for Islamic law. And you know, we're, we're very pleased to have him here with our dear Imam Asfar. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Imam Asfar. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi We're extremely honored to have Sheikh Hassan over an hour and 15 minutes to come here. He has his own community to serve. All with a lot of programs in his community, but he alhamdulillah has blessed us with his time and knowledge so that we can strengthen our relationship with the Quran. Sheikh, although Brother Shayan shared your bio, you could share something personal about yourself. What are your passions? What are your interests? What are your hobbies? Who is Sheikh Hassan? Allah is the Lord. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In the name of the Lord, the Most Gracious, and 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 the Most اللهم اجعل اجتماعنا هذا اجتماعا مرحوما واجعل تفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا من بيننا شقيا ولا محروما we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow this gathering to be a gathering of mercy and for us to be ibn Allah ta'ala depart from this gathering with our shortcoming uh, our shortcomings forgiven and we send our peace and blessings on the greatest creation to walk the face of this earth Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, firstly Allah izikum al khair Shaykhna al Fadl uh, for having me into the beautiful community. I believe this is my second time here. Um, and every time I come out here, I forget that this area exists, actually. You know, when you're, in, when you're so south, you're like, what? there's nothing beyond that, you know? SubhanAllah. Allah <laughs> 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 uh, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in your guys' community and uh, protect and preserve all of you, bi'idhnillah, and your families, uh, bi'idhnillah ta'ala. Uh, as the Sheikh said, uh, I'm uh, your brother, uh, Fisa Bililah, uh, Hassan Natur. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the privilege and the honor to uh, study uh, and live in the blessed city of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for about five and a half years. Um, I was about 12 years old when I put in my head that I wanted to study Sharia. SubhanAllah, growing up, you know, you. Your parents have an influence on you and you just want to be a doctor, right? And you're like, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, but being uh, placed into, actually I was at the Orland Masjid, uh, the Orland Park Prayer Center, they, have, uh, they had a weekend school. And one of my aunts who was actually, a, she's a revert, okay? Uh, her husband is my cousin. Uh, she's a revert. She told my mom, she said, put him in the weekend school. I was like 12 years old again, but subhanAllah, the teachers that were there, they were in their like 20s. And from there, I loved Islam. They made Islam fun to learn, uh, to be with. Uh, it was, uh, you felt like a part of something, subhanAllah. And I put in my head that this is something that I wanted to do. And from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, Allah blessed me with having certain teachers, even imams that were at our masjid that graduated from Medina. And uh, having... Uh, Applied, subhanAllah, I applied, uh, uh, when did I, I applied, uh, like last year of, uh, of, uh, of high school, and I was supposed to go to Umrah, actually, my junior year. And my visa, for some reason, I was going with a group, got rejected. And the rest of the group, they were able to go, but they rejected my visa with the, the reason being that I was too young, even though there was, subhanAllah, people younger than me going. I said, Inshallah, Qadar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the best of planners. It wasn't until my senior year of high school after I graduated, I reapplied for Umrah and I was able to go, alhamdulillah. And when I went, 
I had realized that, uh, you know, I visited the university and I had realized if I had gone the year before, I wouldn't have been able to apply to the university. So subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. And uh, I was, uh, it was after senior year where I applied. And alhamdulillah, I found out about a year and a half afterwards. Uh, you know, this was, uh, this was a passion of mine. Uh, it was a passion of mine. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the tawfiq bin al to 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 fulfill that. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. Which shows the importance of having parents and teachers who make Islam relatable mm-hmm. to our children. Mm-hmm. And all of us, and especially our children, teachers who teach Islam the way they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because as Medina graduates, we have Sheikh Mohammed Abu coming to Shalom. Shalom. And I shared your video. He's, he's my teacher, much better than me. Okay. And I shared your uh, video five to ten minutes ago with Brother Abu where you have to do one thing for each of me. Why? Why is he going to see the rules? That's just the filters. I don't know. 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 Absolutely. Uh, if you don't mind, Sheikh, before I answer the question, I think it's important to take a, a step back, remind ourselves of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he says, مَجْتَمَعَ قَوْمٌ فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ يَتْلُونَ كِتَابُ اللَّهِ وَيَتَدَارَسُونَهُ بَيْنَهُمْ إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّكِينَةِ وَغَشِيَتْهُمُ الرَّحْمَةِ وَحَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدَهُ that whomsoever comes and gathers uh, in the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, contemplating, reflecting on the words of Allah azza wa jal, let that individual know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow tranquility to send on that very gathering. Number one, will engulf those individuals with his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala, will allow the angels to surround those individuals making istighfar for them, all the way up until they depart from that, uh, that very gathering. Uh, it is never, uh, no matter what connections you have or physical ability you have, right? The m- amount of money that you have, the car that you drive, it is none of those factors that get you to enter the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a difference between the physical ability to do something and the spiritual ability to do something. We all have the physical ability to create Qiyam al We all know that Qiyam is one of the greatest ways to get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how many of us pray Qiyam al How many of us fast on Mondays and Thursdays? We know this, the physical ability is there. Walillahilhamd. But the spiritual ability to do something comes from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal giving you that ability to do something. And it is never that you come and you enter the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that Allah azza wa jal has personally invited you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. That Allah cares about you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees something in you that you perhaps don't even see in yourself. And that's why you're here. So every time we remind or we enter the houses of Allah, we remind ourselves that it is an opportunity for us to revive and to rejuvenate our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing what in the houses of Allah? Reading Qur'an, praying. What is Qur'an? What is this, the, the, the book of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There are no words to describe the Qur'an. Literally. Uh, Subhanallah, any, the, the Qur'an is the key to every uh, opportunity of blessings and success in this world and the next. The Qur'an uh, never an individual embarks on the path of the Qur'an, of memorizing and reading and contemplating the Qur'an, except that there will be doors of barakah open in that individual's life that they never imagined being open before. There is never an, uh, you know, uh, 
an individual who engages with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that they extract something, uh, something super beautiful, something that gives them a, a sense of tranquility, serenity on the inside, a, a taste that they will taste that they've never tasted before. And subhanAllah, people will look for that taste, okay? All their lives they will search for that taste. They will search for something that makes them happy. Who doesn't want to be happy? Everybody wants to be happy, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I can't wait to have a miserable day today. Everybody wants to be happy. And Allah Azza wa describes al-haya al-tayyiba, a happy life. And that means being close to Him Azza wa Jal. Okay? When you engage with the Qur'an, you will taste and, and, and achieve a level of happiness that you've never achieved before. Okay? And, and try this. And many of you guys have tried this. Even me, subhanAllah, one time, I woke up, everything was good. I was healthy, I was, alhamdulillah, my family was healthy. There was no issue. But for some abnormal reason, I just felt anxious. I felt like there was, I felt like some sort of anxiety. And I went to my shaykh, and he said, did you open the book of Allah today? And he reminded me, I said, subhanAllah, I didn't. Immediately when I read, when I read Quran, subhanAllah, I was like, something was just lifted from me. There was no worry, there was no stress, there was no anxiety, there was no, uh, you know, Nothing that I was I was struggling with, subhanAllah, when I engaged and began to engage with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a reason why the, the when Allah when Rasulullah taught us the beautiful dua, Allahumma ja'al Qur'ana Rabi'a Kulubina wa Nura Sudurina wa Jala'a Ahzanina wa Dahaba Humumina wa Humumina. This beautiful dua of allowing the Quran to literally uh, bring life to our heart. Imagine your heart as a barren land. There's nothing there. The Quran springs forth, uh, you know, uh, vegetation to that very heart. The, the Quran gives life to that very heart. The Quran is, is, is nur, is light. You know, when it's completely black, it's completely dark, and you see that very little light far, that light is guidance. Showing you that there is a way out. That Qur'an is light. There is never a person that opens the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that uh, the Qur'an gives them, uh, again, a level of tranquility and serenity and peace in their life, in his life or her life. That the Qur'an is a means of removal of any anxiety, any depression, any what we call deeq al-sadr, when you literally feel your heart or your chest being restricted or constrained. Like the tightness of that chest. The Qur'an is a sense of relief. The Qur'an is a sense of relief for that. You know, subhanAllah, uh, I was just giving, before I came here, I was giving a talk to, uh, you know, third graders. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's very beautiful, different dynamics throughout the day, as you know, Sheikh. And we were talking about uh, the beauty of salah. And how salah charges us. It's a charger for us, literally. Right? It charges our souls. We are not, you know, our bodies are just a container for our soul. We are our souls. Our souls is what feels. And if we're not nourishing our souls properly, that is when you will begin to face all of the calamities of this world, all of the, the depression and the, and, the, and the sorrow and the anxiety of this world. When your soul is malnourished, right? When your soul is malnourished. The way that we nourish our souls is having a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what better way than having a relationship with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The book that is our guidance. The book that, that, you know, we recognize us living this life as a test, right? Allah azza wa jal is our teacher. Allah, Allah is not going to speak with you. Okay, he's not going to speak with you. The teacher doesn't give you the answers during the test. But the teacher will give you a study guide. Allah gave us a study guide. It is your GPS, it's your navigation in this world to get you to your final destination. Jannah bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Ya ayyuhannas, 
قد جاءتكم موعظه من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمه للمؤمنين الله describes this book and he says this is advice right this is a, let's just pause on that for a second when your best friend says you know let me give you advice okay many of us it's very difficult for us to accept advice right it's an it's an ego issue and we always have to humble ourselves for critical criticism which is a good thing if it's given to us in a, in a proper manner but allah azza wa is giving us advice our maker our creator he says this is the greatest what just imagine how great this advice is the greatest of advice from your lord and not only that it's a shifa it's a healing it's healing for you it's a mercy for all of the believers right this is the way that allah azza wa describes what the, the 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 quran is right all all books written in this world for the people okay people engage with books of of all sorts from all different authors this book was from the author of authors this book was out of this world literally brought to this earth brought to us down to the people allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says anzalna he brought this book down to us right it wasn't from this earth okay the quran is not just it's not just words on a piece of paper it's literally soul it's soul allah azza wa describes it as he says, uh, That I've given you literally a soul. This is from our command. You didn't know to Rasulullah, you didn't know what the book was or you didn't know what faith was before I brought it to you. Right? We've allowed it to be light to help guide people. To help bring people from the darkness to the light. The light being faith. The light being iman. Allah Azza wa describes this book as your light. Every single individual has faced dark moments. Every person in this room right now sitting here is going through something that you don't know that the other person is going through. There's an individual in this room that is trying to propose to somebody for marriage. There's an individual in this room that's going through a divorce. There's an individual in this room uh, that, you know, is about to graduate. There's an individual in this room, that, uh, in this room that's about to, uh, or applying to some sort of program, right? There's somebody that just got laid off. There's somebody trying to find a new job. Somebody struggling with, with, with family. Somebody struggling to raise their kids. Everybody's going through something you know nothing about. These dark moments that we're in, Allah Azza wa says, allow this Qur'an to be your light. Allow this Qur'an to be your way out. Because this world is not meant for us to stay, right? This world's not meant for us. An interesting thing, you know, one of the scholars said, he said, why do we sleep? He said, why do we sleep? We sleep because our souls can't handle too much of this dunya. You know the hadith, when you sleep, Allah takes your soul. And Allah Azza wa decides whether He wants to return it to you the next day or not. Allah takes your soul. Sleeping is a form of death. Right? It's a minor form of death. Our souls cannot stay in this dunya, for, in this, this worldly realm for too long. It can't handle it. It's not meant to be here. Allah Azza wa says, allow this to be your outlet. Allow you to connect to the Akhirah, to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To find that light, that, that light that you, that you need, that you so desperately need while you're in those, those, those darkest of places. This is the difference, subhanAllah, between you know, uh, you know, somebody that's, that's uh, reading the Qur'an, somebody engaging with the, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means your soul is alive. Your soul is alive. Okay? The difference between... Uh, dead and alive again is your soul whether you you decide to nourish it or not and the quran keeps that alive yet subhanallah we only decide to listen to the quran when we're at aza we're condoling somebody so much so that we've embedded our brains that anytime we hear abdul basit we're at aza anytime that we hear uh, a certain qara it's it's a, it's a sad depressing time 
because we've wired ourselves to be able to engage in the Quran only in certain circumstances. When the Quran is our outlet, the Quran is our charger, the Quran is an everyday, an everyday thing. We have to be able to give life to our souls. We have to be able to nourish our hearts with this, uh, with this, uh, you know, uh, this Quran, with the words of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You know, when we engage with the Quran, uh, there's never a time that you pick up the Quran and you learn something new or you take a different, you know, lesson from the Quran. Why didn't Allah Azza wa not just send tafsir down with the Quran? This is why this verse came down. Why did He not do that? Allah Azza wa He tells us many times in the Quran, "Afala ta'qilun." Do you not think and reflect and ponder? Allah Azza wa Jal brought this Qur'an down so that way we can reflect upon it. Because if we came down and there was a manuscript already with the Qur'an of why everything was the way it is and why it was sent down, we would read it once and call it a day. Never pick it up again. But Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to engage with the Qur'an every single day of your life. That the Qur'an is your best friend, the Qur'an is a part of your life. Right, uh, the Quran is 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 a means and a source of, of your happiness in this in this world, right? Kitab uh, anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyadabbaru ayati. A blessed book that Allah Azza wa Jalla sent down to you so you can reflect and ponder on on the signs of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, subhanahu wa Taala. Afala yatadabbaru al Quran? Am ala qulubin aqfaluha? Do they not reflect and ponder? Upon the Quran, or 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 uh, have they just allowed themselves to be locked, their hearts to be locked from 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 receiving the revelation and the remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala? See, when we decide to step away from the words of Allah Azza Wa Jal, it becomes it becomes an issue. It becomes a spiritual issue, right? Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says it's a spiritual problem, right? They don't remember Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. They don't. They don't have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the love of Allah in their hearts and their hearts start getting locked up because they don't engage with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the eyes and the ears are caught up with everything that distracts them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then their hearts get locked up. Their hearts get locked up because they chose, that individual chose to lock themselves away from the barakah, from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessings that the Qur'an provides for them in, in, in their life, right? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَنْ رَبِّهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ The things that we've decided to do in our lives, the people we decide to hang out with, the things we decide to, to watch, the places we decide to be in, what we decide to input in our ears, those affects our, that all of that are factors in affecting our spirituality. And in, 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 uh, as a consequence to that, Allah Azza wa puts a barrier on us and being ex and having that that acceptance of of uh, of that uh, you know remembrance because of the actions that we've done. The actions that we've done. The Quran is your source of survival, both spiritually and physically. Right? There could be people who are uh, walking on this earth. Physically, they're alive, but wallahi, spiritually, they're dead. Spiritually, they're dead because they have no, they have no connection to the Quran. Everybody, and the beautiful thing is every single individual has a unique relationship with the Quran. And that's something very beautiful. Because when you engage in the Quran, you, get, you extract something different than I extract. Then I come and we share our idea. We listen to the scholars of what they extracted from the Qur'an, from a linguistic perspective, from a jurisprudence perspective, uh, from a, a, you know, a fiqh perspective. A whole bunch of different perspectives. And we begin to share ideas and what we learn and what we extract from the Qur'an and how it, how it implements in, in, in our lives. So yeah, from Shabbat. He extracted Thousand lessons, including this one. Mm. Another scholar that for every verse in the class, all of us can 
extract at least one lesson. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mention what that lesson is. That's on us. Mm -hmm. We have to do, as he mentioned, unlock our hearts. Mm -hmm. Our hearts have been locked. Okay, that's why we haven't been able to reflect on this whole time. And I appreciate you know, so many examples, especially reading the Quran in times of sadness and in times of peace. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah, that question is a, is a very interesting question uh, that we, you know, especially anybody who engages with Quran, teaches in the Quran, gets a lot. Uh, people who have a busy schedule. When I was in Medina, uh, alhamdulillah, I was introduced uh, to one of my, my Quran sheikh, actually. Uh, and I've never seen in my entire life Somebody who had lives life literally like a robot, like a robot, like the strictest schedule. He's in the masjid for every salah. He lives about like I think ten minutes drive from the masjid for every salah. From asr to isha, he doesn't leave the masjid. After asr, he stays all the way to isha. After isha, he goes and visits his mom and dad for a little bit, like 20 minutes, and then goes home, spends time with his family, his kids, they go to sleep. He's awake at uh, like probably almost always an hour before Salat al-Fajr, he's already awake. And then he heads, by at that time he's in the masjid uh, for Salat al-Fajr. He has one day a week, which he sees his friends, Besides, if they come and see him in the masjid, that they hang out. And me growing up, you know, born and raised in Chicago, it's like, 
you know, this is this is like really bizarre, you know. Um, and he used to, you know, push me a lot, lazy al khair, because uh, I used to be a little lazy, you know. He's just like, but I learned a lot, subhanAllah, that we lack discipline. We lack discipline. Islam came down to teach us that discipline that we need. That this life, we're here for a purpose. And you and I don't define that purpose. Allah Azza wa defined that purpose for us. I didn't create you for any reason except to worship me. That's why you're here. That's why we are here. You want to have kids, you want to have a house, you want to have a job, you want to have a car. All of that's beautiful. But that comes secondary to your purpose of you being here. And those things need to bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if any of those things bring you further away from Allah azza wa ta'ala, you got to put yourself in check. And remind yourself, why am I here? And when somebody says, I am busy, how can I include Qur'an in my life? They have not truly understood the barakah of the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an puts barakah in your life. The Qur'an, being busy with the Qur'an, means that Allah Azza wa facilitates khair for everything in, in else in your world. There are people who, I study from this time to this time. I, I, uh, you know, I got to be in school from this time to this time. I got to be in work from this time to this time. I eat, I'm strict on my meal. And then Allah is the last on their schedule. And they don't realize that barakah is literally the ability to do more with less. Barakah is the ability to do more with less. You could have so much time, right? And busy yourself so much, but you, and on top of that, you include, subhanAllah, I've seen people who are in medical school, but they're, exceed, they're excelling in medical school because, and, and people know how, you know, uh, you know, tough that could be, right? Or being in any type of program like that, you know, intense. But they're still in hifth program, or they're still engaging with the Qur'an, and Allah puts barakah in that program. There are how many stories that people go out to the test, I barely studied or I crammed last minute, but you know what I mean? I was reading Qur'an or I made dua or, and Allah put barakah in, my, in, in that experience for me. I'm not giving you a green light to not study and to not do your, your work and then just go make dua. No, you got to do your part. But at the same time, the Qur'an is what provides you uh, that barakah in your life. When you realize that, when you realize that, I, uh, the more that I involve and give to the Qur'an, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give back to me. People don't understand that equation in this world. You're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not one plus one equals two. You're dealing with your creator and your maker. When you're sick, you go to the doctor. Right? Every single one of us is spiritually sick. Myself first and foremost. How can we not turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who do you go to when you're feeling depressed or when you're feeling sad or if you're feeling sorry, you're going through a tough time? Who's going to help you if it's not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah azza wa loves you more than you love yourself. And we love ourselves a lot. Allah loves you more than that. Because if we truly loved ourselves, we would stay away from the things that were wrong for us. The human being is funny. The human being likes what he or she cannot have. We like what we can't have. Right? But Allah Azza wa Jalla loves us more than that. We have to be able to turn to Allah and give to the Qur'an. Uh, because that's when we will receive. The more that you give, the more that you will receive. And we don't understand that, subhanAllah. When you understand that question is a lack of, of, uh, of purification of your mind. It is... And, and the Shaykh was talking about having a strong mind, having a strong heart, right? Uh, the Qur'an gives us clarity in, 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 in thought, right? We emphasize knowledge in our faith. We emphasize certain dua and memorize this dua and, and do this and, and pray this sunnah and make sure you do this. And it's important to uh, learn tajweed and all, uh, all of that's beautiful knowledge, right? But there's almost no emphasis on how to purify our hearts and how to purify our minds. When people come and they ask, what can I tell my teacher when she asks me why we fast? Or how do I make sense to the person who starts laughing at me when my foot is in the sink at the mall and I'm making wudu? 
When we start to ask those questions, right, it means because we are, we are, our minds are not spiritually strong enough to even understand, right? These are good questions because it's, 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 it's asking for an answer. But we haven't trained ourselves how to properly think. Not according to the Qur'an at least, right? Before you need to explain to somebody why to do something that is logical, why don't you ask them why are you do so doing something that is completely illogical, right? Why do you feel the need to explain yourself? Let's change that, that, that narrative here, that perspective. Exactly. Yeah, make it make sense to me why you think celebrating Jesus means that you got to get drunk at a party, you know, or Christmas and stuff like that. We have to be able to change that, 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 that narrative and be proud that Allah Azza wa gave us a purpose through this Qur'an. Allah gave us a purpose through this Qur'an. And that's, that's something very important to understand. Uh, that you have to have that mindset first. Once that mindset is there, this question won't be there. It's just a matter of, I need to read Qur'an now. We have so much time in our days. We have so much time in our days. As busy as we think that we are, we have, Wallahi, we have so much time in our days. Right? If you're in school, I'm not even talking about the time that you spend studying or the time that you're actually in class or the time that you're... What, I'm talking about from you walking to class to class. When you're commuting from home, to school or to work. Your commute was what, 20, 30 minutes, some an hour? What did you do? Every day, imagine every day you listen to a podcast for that hour. Well, you'd be a scholar by the end of the month. <laughs> you'd be standing, sitting here and I'd be there. You'd be a scholar, right? We have so much free time. We have to be able to, to, to realize that. There are some individuals, subhanAllah, that I've met that Allah Azza wa truly has put barakah in their lives. Their families and kids, and on top of that, they have very, you know, uh, tedious jobs that they have to tend to. And they have, uh, they have a whole bunch of obligations, yet they give to the masjid more and more and more. And they're in the masjid every salah. I'm like, how does that even make, make that make sense to me? But subhanAllah, Allah Azza wa facilitates for them in their life you know, like barakah. There's an individual, mashallah, I know, very, very well off and very busy, mashallah. But at the same time, Allah has facilitated in this individual's life, you know, where he could be with his kids and work remote and, and, and have time to give to the, to the masjid. Why? Because he's given so much to the masjid already. Wallahi, it's because of that. The more that you give to Allah, the more that you will see that you will, you will receive. Wallahi. Yeah. And brothers in our community, program right now, maybe are in their forties and they decided to memorize the Quran Inshallah. at a later age, Mashallah they have memorized the Quran. Even though they were working full time. They're working full time on that Mashallah. The Baraka aspect is there in their lives and that will probably make all of our lives I mean, I mean. The one tip I would give to this brother who is saying, I don't have much time, is Allah ma sada. Be conscious of Allah as much as you can. Like I mentioned, an hour long trip to work or to school, use that trip, use that time to listen to Quran. Personally, what's your favorite Quran? Oh, that's a good question. I have a, for every mood that I'm in, I have a different reciter, subhanAllah. Um, subhanAllah. Of and I, was, then, I was just gonna say it was wrong, but yeah. So I was going to, so I've been listening to him the past yeah. few years. And Inshallah. when we were in Medina, uh, you know how you can look at who's reciting and who's not. Mm. So it was him for Fajr Maghrib Asha for wow. four nights. Then we were wondering, oh, I'm so sad. I'm gonna kill Chicago, but it was someone else. But uh, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Uh, Sheikh Johari is amazing. Uh, Sheikh Idris Abkar uh, is very nice as well. Uh, depending on, I like the, the Iraqi style too, sometimes. It's a good vibe, mashallah. How can I engage with the Quran, Shaykh? I know you already mentioned uh, you know, pointers about this as well, but if you want to expand on this, how can I engage with the Quran? So that it's more than listening to it. 
we have to be able to firstly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّي إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا that we've neglected and we've abandoned and we've ignored this book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They read it, but they neglect to implement it in their life. To, they neglect to contemplate on the Qur'an. We have to think of the Qur'an as a prescription. When you're sick and you go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes something for you, and he says you need to take this antibiotic, these eardrops or whatever it is, a certain amount of times, a certain amount of days for a certain amount of you know, uh, again, for a certain amount of days. You will not be healed unless you abide by the way that you're meant to take that, uh, that prescription, that medication. The Qur'an is a medicine for us. It is, it is a medicine for us. And we have to allow the Qur'an to do its part. But you have to do your part as well. Be there mentally and be there spiritually. See, we are filled with diseases of the heart. All of us, because we're not perfect, and we're not meant to be perfect. Because the more that you realize and recognize your imperfection, the more you'll realize the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more that you realize and recognize your weakness, the more you will realize and recognize the strength of Allah azza wa You're not meant to be perfect. You're going to slip up, and that's okay. But Allah azza wa says the best of sinners are those who repent. Continuously, meaning you have a connection with Allah Azza wa Jalla. When you have this connection with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, when you have a connection with His work, with His words, with His book, uh, Subhanahu wa Taala, you are allowing yourself to be cleansed from these diseases of the heart, right? Allowing this this medication to to take its course and to to clean and to heal you, right? Because we read the Quran without understanding. Uthman radiAllahu anhu. He said, لَوْ ظَهُرَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ لَمَا شَبِعَتْ مِنْ كَلَامِ رَبِّكُمْ If your hearts were truly uh, pure, right, having, having pure hearts when engaging with the Qur'an, you would, never, uh, you would never have enough of the Qur'an if your hearts were truly pure. You would never have enough. And for somebody who says it's difficult to open up the Qur'an, I agree with you. If you have no experience, it's actually very difficult. It's painful. And do you know why? You know, interestingly, the receptors in your brain that feel physical pain, that are activated when they feel physical pain, are the same receptors that are activated when an individual tries to mentally heal. Okay? It's painful. It feels painful. Okay, that's why when somebody starts to pray for the first time or starts to read Qur'an for the first time, it's, it's difficult. But I always give the example, imagine, you know, la qaddar Allah, you broke your arm. You go to the doctor, the first thing before the doctor puts the cast on you is he has to put the bone back into place. It's a painful experience. But then he'll cast you. A couple of weeks, a month goes by, you forget that your arm was even broken. Feel the pain. Feeling that pain doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Feeling that pain, walking that journey, opening that door will get you to a place where you need to be. It's going to be painful in the beginning and that's okay. But long term you're going to be better off. See, Islam is not in the business of temporary healing. Islam is in the business of long term healing. People try to numb the pain that they feel on the inside. You know, that void that they feel on the inside. When, you know, that keeps them tossing and turning in the middle of the night. They can't sleep because they're worried about where was I last year and where am I going with my life and what's going to happen and bills and kids and all these worries and, and, and struggles that they're going through. They try to numb that pain by what? They try to numb it with drugs, with alcohol, with inappropriate relationships, right? To distract themselves from what's going on. And all they did was put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. You wake up the next day, the pain is still there. You've done nothing. Islam is not in the business of temporary healing. Islam is in the business of long-term healing. You'll feel the pain now, but long-term you're going to be in a better place for sure. Absolutely. Right? We have to allow the Qur'an to, to take its course and to do and to purify ourselves. Right? 
We're coming. Hold this, I'm sorry. We can have a Quran teacher for the brothers. Those of you, there, there are new Muslims here. We have a Quran teacher who will be able to teach the brothers. We have a sister who will be able to teach Quran to the brothers. Mm. Mashallah, I always say. What better way to remind ourselves of this than before we enter the blessed month of Ramadan? Right? We're in the month of what right now? The Islamic month. Not February. Does anybody know? Sha'ban. When Aisha radiallahu anhu, uh, radiallahu anha, she uh, described Rasulullah as him fasting the entirety of this month. Another narration, he fasted the entirety of this month except a few days. Meaning that when you saw him, you would just assume he was fasting because he was fasting almost the entirety of the month. What was he doing? He was preparing and purifying himself prior before Ramadan. So that way he can reap the benefit in Ramadan. Ramadan doesn't come so that way day one of Ramadan, that's when I pick up the Quran. We start now to plant the seeds and to water the seeds now so we can bear the fruit in Ramadan. So you've prepared for yourself, you know, uh, a, a beautiful jump start to be able to engage with the blessed month of Ramadan. Don't waste the time now and then enter Ramadan and it's like, it takes me 10 days just to get to, to the hang of things. Then the middle of the 10 days, I feel like a dip, you know, because I exhausted myself the first 10 days. And then I got to pick myself back up the last 10 days, right? Utilize your time now to be consistent and start a, 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 a pr the process now, uh, you know, to have that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, the beautiful relationship with Allah. Ramadan is a beautiful month to remind ourselves. The month, literally the month of the Qur'an. Why? Why does Allah Azza wa literally prescribe, prescribe like a prescription? He prescribed fasting on us. Why? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that way you could live a life of being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything that you do, you just want to be closer to Allah. Man. That's, that's your goal in Ramadan. That's why we fast. Because everything that you do, you're asking yourself, is Allah okay with what I'm doing? Is Allah okay with what I'm listening to? Is Allah okay with who I'm hanging out with? Is Allah okay with the, in the places that I'm going? Right? You know, subhanAllah, every time I think of Ramadan, I think of this one story that my uh, shaykh shared with us. One time, there was this brother, and everything was going good in his life. Everything. He was in residency. He was married to the love of his life, and he had two beautiful girls. Everything was going smooth. He was about to finish up and officially start practicing. And he said, you know, the, 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 the context of the story actually, he was speaking to my sheikh. And he was speaking to him after Salat al-Jum'ah, after the khutbah, and he said, Sheikh, this is the first time in years that I've, I've come to the masjid. And he said, why? What happened? And then he started to explain to him the story. He said, about three years ago, everything was going good in my life. And he said, I used to have this practice where I would come home and I would have lunch with my girls and my wife. And he said, I came home one day. I knocked on the door. And you know, usually, you know, my daughters come running to the door. I knocked on the door and nobody came running. So I was like, that's weird. You know, so I opened the door and my house was quiet. And I'm looking for my daughters. I can't find them. I can't find my wife. He said, I go upstairs. And in my bedroom, my wife's on the bed and my two daughters are trying to wake her up and she's not waking up. And he said, now I'm, I'm, a, I'm almost about to officially be a doctor. He said, I can tell my wife has been dead for hours. And he said, from that moment, everything in my life changed. Everything changed. And he said, I lost hope. I lost hope in Allah. And I said, why would Allah do this to me? And therefore, I stopped praying. I stopped reading Quran. I stopped, I stopped all of that because of what I went through right now, what I faced. And he said, fast forward, Ramadan is now, 
right? And he finally goes to the masjid after years. And he attends the khutbah. And he's listening to my shaykh give the khutbah. And what does the shaykh talk about? He's talking about, subhanAllah, there's no such thing as coincidence in our faith. Everything is qadr, everything is decreed, divinely decreed by Allah. The shaykh's topic of the khutbah that day, subhanAllah, so beautifully that that person first time entering the masjid is about the death of Aisha radiallahu the death of the wife of Rasulullah so he goes to the shaykh and he starts crying bawling his eyes out after he told him the story he said shaykh this is my first time and he said I hear this khutbah that you gave and he said I just regret all of the time all of the years that I lost from being close to Allah because I allowed my anger and my sorrow and my sadness to remove me from Allah. When in, when in return, what did Rasulullah teach us after the, the death of, I'm sorry, Khadija radiallahu anha, not Aisha, Khadija, what did, he, what did it teach us? That he got closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than further away. And I used that example in my life, this, itch, this issue, the situation I was in my life to get me further away from Everybody, again, like I said, is going through something we know nothing about. We have to allow ourselves to get closer to Allah. Allow these situations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shake us at our core. أَمْ حَسِبَتُمْ أَن تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةِ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِكُمْ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ خَلَوْا مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَزُلْزِلُ Did you think that you're going to get into Jannah for free? The people were literally tested with poverty, tested with all of these calamities, these trials, these tribulations. They were shaken at their core so much so that them and Rasulullah said, Mata Nasrullah, when is the victory of Allah coming? Ala inna nasrullahi qareeb. The victory of Allah is near. And we have to be patient during that, 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 that calamity or whatever we're facing. The Quran is there to remind us of that every time we pick up the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we engage not with just the litigation of the Qur'an, halal and haram, but we engage with the stories of the Qur'an, the stories of the prophets, right? The journey of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, every verse coming to him at a certain time, a particular moment in his life, right? Just to give you a, like an example, like I'm just going on a little tangent. When Rasulullah was kicked out of his home, Mecca, right? he said, Wallahi, I would not leave except that they, I was forced to leave. I was kicked out of my home. He's looking at Mecca while he's, while he's leaving. Right? He's in the mountain and he's looking at Mecca. He's still traveled to Medina. And he starts to cry. At that moment, the scholars say the verses of uh, Surah Al-Qasas was sent down to Rasulullah where Musa was reminded of Musa's, where Rasulullah was reminded of Musa's mother having to throw him into a river. But Allah reminded Musa's mom that he will come back to you and we will make him from the believers. And Allah Azza wa tells Rasulullah at that moment uh, that by the one that gave you the Quran, we're going to return you back to this very land that you were kicked out. Just as Musa was kicked away from his family and his land, but he was returned, we will return you back to this land. Look at how beautiful the Qur'an is. That every verse came down during a specific moment of the, of the life of Rasulullah Right? The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that would give us, that gives us serenity and peace that came from Allah Azza wa to Jibreel alayhi salam. That Jibreel taught Rasulullah directly. It was preserved in his heart. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he would recite the Qur'an, he would cry and he would make others cry around him. Umar radiallahu anhu was always seen with two tear marks on his cheeks from how often he would cry when he would engage and read the Qur'an. Uthman radiallahu anhu would finish the Qur'an every single night he would read it. Ali radiallahu anhu, uh, some friends came to him when he was praying Qiyam al-Layl and he was standing up uh, for a very long time reading Quran and reciting Quran and they would tell him إِلَى مَتَى هَذَا الْقِيَامَ الطَّوِيلِ Like, like uh, how long are you going to stand like this for? He said طَرِيقُ الْآخِرَ طَوِيلِ 
ويحتاج إلى زاد that the road, the path to getting to the next life is a long one. And it requires for us to persevere and for us to do and increase and more and more and more. Who was the model or the role model? It was Rasulullah who taught them how to do this. Right? To love the Quran, to recite the Quran. Wallahi, it's never, you know, there's never a time that you engage with Quran from any aspect, from listening to it from reading it, from contemplating on it, from memorizing it, except that you will receive something in your life, an increase in your rizq, a happy marriage, kids that are fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you've done nothing. It wasn't your tarbiyah. It was the fact that you engaged and you were a pious and righteous servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah azza wa jal blessed your kids to be righteous. In Surah Al-Kahf, we're reminded every, every, every Friday uh, that their, their, the father was, was a righteous man. That's why those, those, the orphans were preserved. Their, 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 their inheritance was preserved because of their father being a righteous person. Be a righteous person. Have a relationship with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and watch the preservation around you happen that Allah azza wa jal will, 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 will allow to happen. Yeah, we're not going to be like the Sahaba. We won't be. You're not going to be, we're not going to be able to recite the Quran every single night before we go to sleep. Right? But like one of the, the scholars, he says, فَتَشَبَّهُ إِن لَمْ تَكُونُ مِثْلَهُمْ إِنَّ التَّشَبُّهَ بِالْكِرَامِ فَلَاحُ You know, uh, imitate them. Try to be like them because even if you fall short, at least imitating them is a form of success. Imitating them, trying, you'll, you, you, even if you fall short, you're still, you're still successful. In the night, Dad. Most of you I've seen are using it sometimes in the salah. And I know there's a difference of opinion whether or not you can hold the hold this while you're reading the salah or while you're praying the salawi prayers. And we're going to talk about the fiqh of salawi next week. But I've seen people they're, they're reading the Quran or they're following the Imam, and all of a sudden a message comes. Right? <laughs> How distracting is that? Have your own personal connection to your own mushaf just because you can. Just as you can memorize the Quran with hearing, you can also memorize the Quran with your sight as well. If, is it possible for non-scholars to extract meanings from the Quran and have a connection with the Quran or is the Quran for a select group of people? The Roman Empire, they did not, for a period of time, they did not allow Christians to read the Bible. What about the Quran? Is it just for the elite? The Qur'an is a book for all of mankind. And as we said, every, every individual will extract something, subhanAllah, very different. 
not to belittle, of course, we, we, there are things in the Qur'an that we cannot understand without context, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ask the people of knowledge in the fact that you don't know, and we utilize and, and revere our, our scholars uh, you know, to, uh, to provide us that knowledge. But everybody engages with the Qur'an, and every person that engages with the Qur'an receives something from the Qur'an without a doubt. The Qur'an gives us life, and as I said, the difference between uh, having uh, being dead and alive is your soul being alive. The way that you keep your soul alive is through the Qur'an. The person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus the person who does not remember Allah azza wa jal is literally that is the difference between being dead and alive. Right? And we have to be able to give our souls that life. Allah Azza just says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ That those who believe and, and find that serenity and that tranquility in the remembrance of Allah, for sure they will, they will receive that. For sure their hearts will be at ease. You know, we've all felt what it means to be, uh, to have that unsettling feeling. We've had that before, every single individual. But when you're at ease and when you're comfortable and when you're content and when you're happy, it is one of the greatest feelings ever. And you can only feel that by being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By, by having that dhikr in your life. And what better dhikr? There's no greater dhikr than the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Uh, uh, this, this gives you that sweetness, uh, sweetness in life. Because we've filled, again, Allah Azza wa Jal, when Ramadan comes, He reminds us, you know, 11 months out of the year, you filled yourself with all of that toxicity. This one month, devote yourself to Allah Azza wa Jal. Devote your time to the Qur'an. Devote your time to ref purify yourself your fast helps you purify yourself so you can be right, or in the right state of mind to accept the Qur'an, to, to withstand the taraweeh prayer and the extra prayers and your salah, to be able to extract the benefits of that, right? That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 11 months out of the year, you fill yourself with all of that, that nonsense. It's this month in which you need this, this, this literally the this spiritual boot camp for yourself, right? Uh, we have to be able to live our dhikr, to implement our dhikr. It is a book for, for every single individual. Allah Azza wa says, وَالذَّاكِرِينَ وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ وَالذَّاكِرِينَ وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا That for, for, for those who, who, any man or woman who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what gets you, uh, you know, when you rejuvenate and revive your faith, Allah Azza wa Jal has nothing prepared for them except Jannah bi idnillahi ta'ala. Except Jannah bi idnillah. Right? And when we engage with the words of Allah, when we engage with any type of ibadah, Rasul taught us the manner in which to do so. Sometimes we become overzealous and we want to do so much and then we burn ourselves out. Right? And Rasul he said, Alaykum min al a'mali ma tutiqoon. Only do as much as you can handle when it comes to good deeds. Don't aim the bar, you know, very little or super high where you can't achieve it. But a little bit, right, in, in the middle somewhere where it's not too low, it's not too high, you can, it's achievable and you can excel and progress on that. And he says, The best of deeds are are, are the deeds that are consistent, even if they're little. Even if they're little. When you engage with the Qur'an, even if it's a little, you start off with a half a page a day, with a line a day if you can't read half a page. A line a day. You move to a half a page. Right? To then a full page, to, to a hizb, to, to a juz. Right? You, you increase little by little. And that is the beauty of it. It's not a flipper switch. It's not an all or nothing. We have to be giving our time. It's, the, it's the, at least whatever we can, anything from the Quran, every single day of our lives, right? 
this is, Allah does not need anything from us. Allah doesn't need us to read the Quran. Allah doesn't need our du'a, Allah doesn't need our salah, does not make Allah more powerful, does not make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, have more ownership over anything. Allah doesn't need it, we need it. We need it. Why do we make du'a? Doesn't Allah already know what's in our heart and what we're going to ask? Allah already knows that we're going to ask it, Allah already knows what He's going to provide for us. Why do we make du'a? Du'a, we make it, why? Uh, SubhanAllah. Even psychologists talk about this idea. When there's something internal and you verbalize it, right? It allows you to truly contemplate. It allows you to truly connect uh, and have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You know how, has anybody ever vented before to their best friend? I think everybody's vented, right? You just call somebody and just lay everything on them. You're like, you know what? I can't stand this person. I don't know why. I'm and they're like, okay, this person just goes away. I'm just, I'll just there listen, right? They don't need you to answer. They don't need you to talk back. They don't want any answer from you, as a matter of fact. If you, get a, if you give them an answer, they're going to fight with you, right? They just want you to listen to them. We talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clear our minds and to clear our hearts. We already know Allah knows what, we're, uh, what is on our mind. It's not for Allah, it's for us. It is for us. To be able to navigate through all of these uh, these these trials and these tribulations that we that we face, right? Uh, we have to be able to understand that. Oh, yeah, for sharing how the Quran yeah. is for all. Yeah. People who have a beer, people who want to help, even in that, it's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And it, as Sheikh mentioned, it can be intimidating, especially for new Muslims or even Muslims who haven't been reading the Quran. It can be intimidating. Reading the Quran, but the advice of me was to, especially if you're a beginner, is to on a one have a solid translation, like a really, really good translation, just like there on the right hand side of Professor Ahmed Zabi Ahmad. He had a solid grasp of the Arabic language and the English language, study tradition. So if you want a translation expensive, sixty, seventy dollars, that's what I would. Mm -hmm. all scholars and that's personally what I do. And number two, now, mashallah, many of the classical works of tafsir are translated. So the tafsir is translated. The tafsir is translated. Right? So there's no excuse. Do what we can in regards to having that connection with the Quran. And another thing that we should know is that yes, the companions will read, as the Sheikh mentioned, sometimes finishing a week. For the sake of reward, for the sake of memorization. But another ahadith, other ahadiths in the tweet tell us that they would have another reading for khatam. And that khatam can take like five years, 30 years. So that's another thing to keep in mind. That the shuyuk, the, the, the sahaba would essentially have two bookmarks one bookmark for completing the Quran every seven days, and another bookmark for khatam. And they would say after they would complete 10 verses of the Quran, now we have learned the sacred knowledge and we have learned the inner depths of this of these ayat. Now we can continue with the next 10 verses. Because they, they wouldn't read, they wouldn't memorize more than 10, they wouldn't try to memorize and learn those additional 10 verses and then reverse it, complete it the, the previous 10. That's something to keep in mind. We're out of time, Shaykh. You one last question. How can I ensure that my actions are in line with the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah? Very good question, subhanAllah. Uh, in life, we try to find this balance. All these questions, I should ask you again. I don't need to answer. SubhanAllah. <laughs> I don't even have to do much work. He asked me. Did you problem. realize? I didn't realize. Yeah, I, I still have our, I still have our, our mm. right? These are some tough questions, Sheikh. I can't wait <laughs> to ask you these. <laughs> yeah. uh, we don't have to go much far last year. Uh, Subhanallah. Well, uh, well, 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 <laughs> Subhanallah, we try to find this balance in life. Everybody tries to find this balance. 
you know, Islam tells me one thing. I'm seeing a completely different thing living in society. These people from this country live this way. These people from this country live this way. I'm in America. I'm here. I'm what now? My ethnic background plays a role. And I'm just trying to find what makes sense to me. And I asked my sheikh actually a similar question. And he said, balance is not what you think balance is. Balance is looking at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and living a life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he taught us what balance is. He taught us what balance is. Our faith is not based off of our whims and our desires and our fantasies. What I think makes sense, what I feel is right, this is what makes most sense to me, you know? Did you ever hear, hear that nowadays? Like everybody, subhanAllah, everybody's, everybody's a scholar, everybody has a platform, everybody wants to talk. You, you're on TikTok and people are on live and people are asking people who have no knowledge about Islam, is this halal or is this haram? And, oh, I don't think so. It doesn't, that wouldn't make sense. And with all due respect, who are you to, to decide what that makes sense? And that's one of the gravest sins is to speak, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have no knowledge about that. Like Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he said that somebody who speaks without knowledge about the religion of Allah is a liar. Even if he or she did not intend to lie, they are a liar, right? It's something scary to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? To speak about Allah azza wa you don't know, you know? And people will, they'll come up and, and they'll think this is what makes sense to me, this is what I feel right. Islam is based off of what Allah factually knows is best for you, is best for society, is best for the world around you. That is what our faith is based off of. This is the law of Allah. This is the perfect law. It's not tainted by the viewpoints or perspective of man. Right? We are the slave. Allah is our master. So when we look for balance, we look at how Rasulullah lived balance in all aspects of his life. He said, your family has a right on you. Your soul, your faith has a right on you. Right? Allah has a right on you. And you have a right on yourself, taking care of yourself. And we all know the famous hadith where, some, where the, the companion, some of the companions like, oh, I devote my time to Allah. I'm going to fast every single day or I'm not going to get married or... Also said, no, I get married, I fast and break my fast, and you guys are not going to be better than me, <laughs> point blank. We're not better than Rasulullah and we'll never be better than Rasulullah ever, right? He lived balance, balance with your family, balance with society, balance with, uh, with, with your faith, giving, your, giving everybody its right and their right. This was somebody وسلم, who was the ruler of the Muslims, the leader, right? He was the walking Qur'an as he was described وسلم. How did he learn that balance? It didn't come from him. It came from Allah Azza wa Jal. It came from implementing the Qur'an. The more that you engage with the Qur'an, the more that you implement the Qur'an, the more that you will find and live that balanced life the more that you will be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more that you will stay away from the things that Allah Azza wa Jal wants you to stay away from. Right? And I'm going to end with, with this one hadith uh, uh, that, that I love, subhanAllah. That everybody, you know, Rasulullah he says, مَا مِنْ عَبْدٍ مُؤْمِنٍ إِلَّا وَلَهُ ذَنْبٌ يَعْتَادُهُ أَلْفَيْنَ تَبَعْدَ أَلْفَيْنَ there is not a single believer except that he habitually commits a sin from time to time. Everybody commits sin here and there. Right? Or a sin that that person persistently commits all the way up until they leave from this world. You're either one of the two. You either commit a sin here and there every now and then, or you're somebody who is consistent on a sin all the way up until you leave this world. That the believer is created vulnerable to temptation. 
the believer is at that same time is always going to be a true believer in a state of tawbah, in a state of repentance. Well, the believers are forgetful. When they are reminded, they will remember. We engage in the Qur'an to remind ourselves. The Qur'an is, it's, a lot of it is very repetitive actually. It's a reminder. Qutbah Jum'ah, the Jum'ah prayer, is not supposed to be a high scholarly lecture. It's supposed to be a reminder. Ramadan is a reminder. You're praying five times a day is a reminder of why you're here on this earth. It's all a reminder of you, what your purpose is, to remind yourself of what your purpose is and what you're doing here. We're all sinners at the end of the day. But the more that we remind ourselves, the more that we will remember to, to be in, in the path of living a life that is pleasing to Allah, a balanced life. A balanced life. When, when, when one time one of the, the companions came to Rasulullah and he said, Wa He literally came overwhelmed with the amount of bad deeds that he has. That he, He's like, basically, I'm, I've destroyed my own self with all of the mistakes that I've made. Rasulullah said, what's wrong? Right? You know, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I, I've, just, I, I've just wronged myself with all of these sins. And Rasulullah, he said, Qul, say, Allahumma inna maghfirataka awsa'u min dhunubi, wa, rahmatu, wa rahmatuka arja indi min amali. Ya Allah, your forgiveness is greater than my evil, and my hope in your forgiveness is better than my hope in my own good deeds. Right? And Rasulullah he said, say this again. Say it again. He said it three times. He said, Qum faqad Allah Leave because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. You have to have that, that sincere heart, that pure heart, uh, that seeks repentance. And you will get that sincerity the more that you engage with the book and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Allah Azza to allow us to be from Ahl al-Qur'an, Allahum ja'al al-Qur'an rabi'a qulubina wa nura sudurina wa jala'a ahzanina wa dhahaba humumina wa dhumumina may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be people of the Qur'an and to remain steadfast bi Allah ta'ala in our faith uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and preserve us bi Allah ta'ala and allow us to be ambassadors of hope and beacons of peace bi Allah ta'ala ambassadors of our faith bi Allah ta'ala to the world around us to our families bi Allah may Allah azza have mercy on our brothers and sisters in Gaza, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, heal the wounded and uh, accept their martyrs bi idnillahi ta'ala. May Allah azza wa jal give them a, a, a victory, a quick victory bi idnillahi ta'ala. Hada wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullahu khayran jami'an. It was an absolute pleasure to be here with you all and I ask you to please forgive me if I said did or anything uh, to offend any of you in any way, shape or form. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your community. بارك الله فيك and بارك الله فيك شيخنا for allowing me this opportunity جزاكم الله خيرا